uh, I'm humbled actually to uh, be on the same program with uh, uh, Dr. D and Kano uh, because they're the ones uh, you know that have done the research and uh, allowed practitioners such as myself to uh, apply that. Now, uh, the practitioners ask the questions though, don't they? Uh, I, I know through the years uh, uh, when Scott uh, finally discovered that he could, you know, that PERS uh, was transmitted uh, by aerosol, my first question is yes, but how far? And he continues to, uh, to do that and uh, all the stuff I'm presenting today actually uh, is a, just a, a uh, uh, summary of a lot of the applied work that Scott has uh, has done with his team at the uh, University of Minnesota and it it's working it's working uh, the biggest thing is to, to educate uh, the guys in the barn uh, the producers and uh, to transfer that knowledge then uh, to them so just a word on biosecurity uh, uh, it ain't what we don't know that gets us into trouble. It's it's what we know for sure that just ain't so. And uh, that's applied a lot of times over the uh, last uh, 10 or 15 years. So what is biosecurity? Precautions taken to minimize the risk of introducing an infectious disease into an animal population. And so you could actually put it into a formula. It's a function of, uh, of the uh, probability of exposure, uh, the consequences, or the harm of that introduction, and then uh, the uncertainty of uh, that event that occurs. I just listened to a talk by uh, Scott Hurd yesterday, and he's uh, the master of risk assessments on our antimicrobial issue in pigs. And, and uh, so if you got questions on risk assessments, Scott Hurd is, is the man to go to. I like to use the analogy of, uh, of a rowboat uh, when it comes to biosecurity. And uh, so imagine you're in a, in, out on, in a rowboat uh, in a lake and uh, there's a number of holes in that, uh, in that rowboat. And so your first instinct would be to close the big holes first. And we're doing that. Uh, we're doing that with biosecurity. But even after you get the big holes closed, uh, there's smaller holes that you're not sinking as fast, but eventually you will sink if you don't close those uh, smaller holes. And so I think of the big holes as direct inter introduction of PERS or, or a disease, and the small holes is the indirect introduction of, uh, of PERS. So we want to minimize the number of contacts that might result in disease and eliminate the sources of, those, uh, of that infectious agent. So one of the big, uh, one of the big holes is... Uh, you know where we're located with our pig farms, and uh, if we're uh, you know in a really pig dense area uh, such as this uh, in Mexico, uh, it's going to be harder and harder. Uh, you know this is a big hole, so um, you know location isolation is important. Hygiene is important. Um, diseases which can be prevented or eliminated from swine TGE. I mean we've we've been successful with all these uh, APP. Actinobacillus, uh, um, pseudomonia, pseudorabies, mycoplasma, and now uh, PERS. Uh, we've uh, got you know case after case now where we've been able to uh, eliminate that virus from a from a farm. There's some diseases that you know we probably uh, could, but we shouldn't try to eliminate in all cases, and and a lot of those are the bacterial uh, infections. So. Risks of introduction. We talked a little bit about direct and indirect. Well, direct introduction uh, of, uh, of disease would be through live animals and semen. And so uh, uh, we take out our checkbook, uh, pay for some gilts, walk them off the truck, and they're positive, and uh, we infect our farm. Uh, same thing with semen. But this has gotten much, much better. Uh, whereas 10, 20 years ago, uh, this was happening on a regular basis. Now it's rare uh, because of the things we've learned uh, through science and research we've uh, been able to uh, improve our testing, our monitoring, our isolation and, uh, and quarantine time and uh, we're seeing fewer and fewer cases now where uh, gilts or boars or even semen uh, uh, it still happens but it's a lot less common uh, than it used to be so that was a huge hole that we closed in the bottom of that boat the indirect causes, though, are uh, still out there, and we still see that. And uh, this is the list here. The existing facilities, we didn't get it out uh, before we put pigs back in. Transportation, Scott's work with transportation and, 
and uh, the uh, disinfecting and drying of trailers, all that uh, has uh, led to huge improvements. Personnel, still ongoing research with uh, personnel and downtime. Uh, needles, we know we can transmit uh, um, PERS virus with, uh, with needles, and so we've adopted uh, some needless uh, uh, technology in some cases. And then insects, again, Scott's work uh, up at uh, Minnesota proved that we could mechanically transmit uh, uh, PERS virus with uh, mosquitoes and flies. And then the big one was aerosol. So we talked a lot, uh, we talked already about the direct routes of transmission. Besides just the live animals, how do they submit, they, do they transmit it? Well, it could be in their blood, saliva, milk, colostrum, urine, feces, and uh, semen. And this is at one time our greatest risk, it was our greatest risk. Uh, semen is uh, known to carry a number of path pathogens, uh, but especially uh, PERS. But we've, uh, you know, circled the wagons and found ways to uh, to filter the boar studs, uh, to keep them negative, and then to do uh, constant monitoring uh, for uh, for that disease. Uh, the ASV developed this uh, the boar stud guidelines a few years ago, and uh, that really. Um, kind of uh, characterize the risks and uh, standardize the procedures for boar studs. So we have pre-entry health requirements, isolation health requirements, health requirements for the resident herd, and then hygiene and sanitation requirements so during the semen collection process and, story, and storage. So indirect routes of transmission, uh, existing facilities all in, all out, uh, prevent the, the uh, spread from pathogens from, from various ages of pigs, the age segregation uh, piece of the, uh, of the puzzle, and then strict sanitation. So removing all the organic material, uh, efficacious disinfectants, and uh, allow those, uh, those facilities completely dry uh, before putting pigs back in. The indirect routes, I mentioned this already, uh, uh, needles. Uh, Scott proved that you can move uh, PERS virus uh, with uh, with needles from one pig to another uh, with the uh, vaccination of mycoplasma. So something uh, totally ir irrelated to or unrelated to uh, the FERS virus can be transmitted with uh, needles. And so we're seeing new technologies in this area and they're getting better. You know, at first there were some, um, there were some challenges with uh, needleless, uh, takes some special skills. I know on farms it takes a champion uh, when these things uh, break down, they've, uh, uh, they've got to be able to uh, access parts and, and repair them. So that's getting better. Transportation, again, organic material, uh, if it's, uh, if it's you know, wet and uh, contains the PERS virus, you've got to get it out of there. You've got to be able to disinfect it, have the proper disinfectants with enough uh, exposure time uh, to uh, kill that virus. And then dry is dead. So if we know if we can uh, uh, completely dry those trailers after they're cleaned and disinfected, uh, they're safe to use on the next load. So there's been some things that have sped, uh, helped to speed up that uh, drying time and, and uh, there's been a lot of work with, uh, with the uh, thermo-assisted drying and decontamination uh, process as well as the trailer baking process. And uh, so they, they heat these trailers up, uh, blow a lot of air through them, and uh, so it, uh, it lowers that, uh, decreases that time that, those, uh, that it takes to get those trailers free of PERS virus. The loading chute uh, at the farms, it, I mean, uh, there's, there's been uh, strides made in this as well. And uh, the concept of transfer stations came up. So to keep uh, um, outside virus from uh, even approaching the buildings. Um, is there a pointer here? Uh, anyway, I can use this. So this would be the inner sanctum, the uh, pigs that we want to protect. They use an inner sanctum trailer uh, to uh, bring those pigs to, to the road. And um, uh, back up to that, to these uh, buildings here, uh, unload the pigs, close the door, pull the inner sanctum trailer away, and the outer trailers pull up to those uh, buildings and uh, pick up the pigs. And so the outside trailers that could potentially be contaminated never reach the, uh, the inner sanctum of our uh, healthy pigs. And so the reason this farm has two of them is they had one for, for uh, cull loads and one for uh, uh, select loads, just to put another layer of protection in there. Gates and perimeter fencing and signage. Uh, we've had cases where uh, gates weren't locked or they were open. 
um, a truck driver uh, is lost with a load of pigs, pulls into the wrong farm. And so little things like this prevent that from happening. And so we, uh, we urge signage, you know, so that the, uh, the farm uh, name and location is, uh, is listed, a telephone number to call, uh, as well as gates. A word on rendering. Don't do it. I mean, every time we allow an outside truck, especially something as potentially contaminated as a rendering truck, to pull onto the place, we have a chance of uh, dragging uh, contaminants in, into the farm. So any method of uh, carcass disposal uh, is more desirable than allowing a rendering truck to uh, uh, come near the uh, premises. And so composting and incineration, both of those deactivates the, uh, uh, the pathogens that we're most worried about. Human vectors. Here again, um, uh, Scott's done a lot of uh, work uh, with uh, his aerosol uh, pro uh, project that uh, actually relates to the human uh, process too. And so for uh, two years straight, he made uh, one overnight from a positive uh, barn to the negative barns, the high health barns, uh, with never transferring that on human beings. And so we learned that these extended downtimes are unnecessary. So you, you'll hear of farms that with uh, three and four and five day required downtimes. Uh, and Scott's pretty much proven that for PERS that it's, uh, it's just not necessary. One overnight uh, will do it. Uh, of course, shower in, shower out. Uh, Scott's uh, people on that, on that uh, uh, study showered after they got uh, in at night and then uh, uh, put on clean clothes and, and went out and, uh, to the uh, negative pigs or the uh, naive pigs the next day. And uh, so we know that uh, those kind of things work. But more than the shower, it's probably the uh, change of boots and coveralls uh, that uh, is uh, responsible for uh, uh, keeping purrs out. We want to talk a little bit about the uh, biosecurity pyramid uh, for downtime. And so every system, every farm uh, needs to know what the process is, for the uh, downtime from uh, the top of their pyramid to the next farm to the next farm. And so you wouldn't want to go back up that pyramid. And uh, there's a uh, hundred ways to uh, demonstrate these, to communicate it to, uh, to uh, workers and, and servicemen. But, uh, but it's important so that everybody knows uh, what that uh, pyramid is and what the downtime requirements are to, uh, to go down. Um, I mentioned boots and coveralls before. Um, the, uh, the Danish system, uh, and, you know, for years they have not uh, taken showers. They, they off their street clothes, step over a board, wash their hands, uh, don the uh, clothes inside the, uh, the barn or the uh, farm clothes and they have never uh, knowingly transmitted uh, disease into a farm that way. Uh, I like the bench method, so you, you uh, actually create a barrier, a bench, to, somebody has to off their shoes, then swing their legs over, and uh, even uh, the, uh, the inexpensive uh, plastic uh, booties uh, give us some cheap form of protection of what might be on street shoes as they enter the farm. We're seeing more security cameras put up that uh, will uh, loop the recording over and over. So if something bad happens, we can go back and look and see if there's been, you know, uh, some unwanted visitors at a farm. This is not just for biosecurity, but, uh, you know, in case there would be theft or, or vandalism. And we're seeing more and more of those uh, developed. There are tools that we can use to uh, kind of close down those gaps, close those holes. This is an example of the Danish system. Uh, so the outsiders come in to, uh, uh, to the dirty side, take their clothes and shoes off, uh, step into the changing area, which is just a, a graded uh, board, uh, raised area slightly. Uh, they wash their hands, step over into the clean side and don their clothes. And uh, this was adequate. So it's not so much the, uh, the act of taking a shower and, and blowing your nose and that type of thing as it is uh, cleaning your hands, um, and uh, clothing and, and footwear. I, I took this picture accidentally, actually, of the ground, but as I was going through putting this together, I thought that would remind me that how important it is to, uh, to stress and to teach the uh, personnel of farms that the ground is always potentially contaminated. And so if they uh, can grasp that concept and believe that, uh, they're less likely to step out of a barn uh, as they're checking bulk bins or something and stepping back in. 
And so we repeat over and over, the ground is red, the ground is red, the ground is red. And uh, they have to develop uh, protocols then to, uh, to not step outside the building and back in. Other uh, indirect routes of transmission, insects, house flies, and mosquitoes. Scott's proven that, uh, that uh, uh, those house flies and mosquitoes can actually uh, uh, suck up some uh, or, or contaminate themselves with uh, uh, PERS virus and then uh, fly to the neighbor and, uh, and contaminate a herd. Uh, avian vectors, uh, uh, again, uh, early on in the, uh, in the fight against PERS, we thought that waterfowl were a big deal. But here again, if, uh, you know, I, I can't remember the last time I saw a duck or a goose inside a pig building. And so if they did, you know, if they did act as mechanical uh, vectors of uh, PERS virus, as long as the personnel inside the buildings don't step out and step back in, we're safe there. And then, of course, aerosol. It's been uh, a huge, uh, a huge finding and and uh, a lot of work that Scott has done to, uh, to prove this aerosol. And uh, he's got it up to five miles. And uh, I think we'll probably find it further. Just a, a, another word on um, uh, rodents and birds. Uh, there's a great tools available from the pork board uh, on, uh, to educate and communicate these uh, messages to, uh, uh, to producers. And I always like to remind uh, uh, you know, the managers, producers, and veterinarians that, uh, you know, we've got a lot of resources that we can go to to help educate our people. Long distance uh, aerosol, uh, you know, I think it's uh, certainly, Scott has proven it, I think we're going to uh, start to find it uh, a lot further. This was a collage, just a landscape picture. I topped the hill one day in central Nebraska, nice uh, uh, low wind uh, day sunny day and I got out of the truck up on that hill and I just snapped pictures of uh, somebody was obviously burning tires over here at the source or some some kind of rubber that caused black smoke and I estimate this was nine or ten miles uh, it was a full 90 degrees on the horizon that that uh, that smoke trail went and so for my feeble mind I think uh, this could be a good example of how uh, PERS could get trans uh, transmitted uh, via aerosol. So what do you do to battle that? Certainly uh, uh, Scott started with the uh, HEPA filters. They, they obviously work. They, they work very well and uh, now his research is focused on how do we, how do we uh, cheapen that up? How do we uh, do it uh, with uh, fewer resources and uh, make these farms uh, safe to uh, aerosol transmission? And as he mentioned, uh, wow, just uh, uh, Farms in hog dense areas have been able to keep this virus out now. Other fomites, again, uh, Scott's work. Uh, he just sets about uh, uh, looking at the practical applications of uh, of the research, and he's proven that we can easily move virus with tools and supplies, cartons, bags, repairs, and so those are those are small holes that uh, we don't want to forget about, or else we can spend a lot of money on uh, fil air filtration on a farm and then allow it to be broken down by one of these small holes, still sink. So uh, it's important that uh, after you, I mean even before you do all the, uh, the work to, to uh, uh, filter a farm and, and spend the money that you, you take care of these, uh, these smaller things. And, and he then created a way to do that. Is it, a lot of farms are now uh, uh, have quarantine uh, rooms attached to them and nothing is introduced into those, uh, those farms without being uh, disinfected and quarantined for a period of time. Uh, Dr. Kano me mentioned the uh, pad wrap assessment. This has been a tremendous tool, not only for assessing risk uh, and finding those risks, but for educating our producers. Without fail, when I sit down and do a, 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 a risk assessment with this tool, um, I, I find managers, producers, owners saying, oh, you know, that's a great idea. We should do that. And so uh, I've actually uh, seen systems where they've been able to move their risk um, uh, down that, uh, that risk scale uh, substantially. And so uh, this, was, uh, this was one system uh, that I don't have the, uh, the three years, but it just those red dots. Uh, this is the low risk quadrant. This is the high risk quadrant for internal and external. And with
with education and uh, you know targeting resources, you can move those farms, existing farms, down that uh, that risk profile quadrant. And just to mention too, there's uh, almost 2,000 farms now that have uh, have completed these risk assessments as of February. Probably this summer we'll go over 2,000 easily. Uh, BI's been a, a large help on this in that they hire 10 to 15, uh, maybe 20 interns this summer. Uh, they're trained on this risk assessment and they go out and help veterinarians uh, get their risk assessments done on the farms. Uh, now there's a, there's a risk assessment developed for the growing pig herd and already, uh, it was just introduced uh, last year, and already we've got 155 sites uh, uh, completed. There's some uh, research that's being done on asking the question, why do these farms break? And so if we get to that critical mass of enough farms that have been risk assessed, we're going to be able to, uh, to determine which farms break repeatedly, what are, the, what are the, uh, the characteristics of those farms compared to the farms that, uh, that seldom break. So success with biosecurity. Uh, I told somebody yesterday that really what you want is a crop failure. Uh, when it comes to uh, biosecurity. But without discipline, accountability, and belief on the farm with the guys that are, that are taking care of the pigs every day, um, we will never uh, create success. And so uh, that's the biggest challenge, I think, is we've got the tools, we've got the knowledge, uh, we're learning more every day, uh, but we've got to transfer that knowledge down to the farm. And that's where you guys come in. Um, believe me, I see, uh, I see the publications on the, the uh, break room tables uh, at nearly every farm that I go in. And so uh, it is well read. Your, uh, your uh, hard work is paying off. And I always tell people too, there's no shortcuts. And uh, uh, sometimes we ask the wrong questions, like this guy say, what's, what's a mountain, going, mountain goat doing way up here in this cloud bank? Well, obviously they're disoriented and they're asking the wrong question. And so I hear this thing a lot too. Tell me what I have to do to fix this problem without changing anything. And it just doesn't work that way. You've got to wear out some shoe leather and, uh, and do the hard work and uh, close the holes. So another plug for, uh, for uh, uh, Scott and his team, uh, Satoshi Otaki and Andrea Petkin, uh, they have summarized their work into this uh, biosecurity uh, manual. And to me, it's a, it's a great resource. It's a great Bible. I place it in the hands of, of uh, uh, producers, and it summarizes all the research that's been done um, uh, up until till now. And I think uh, Scott uh, told me this morning they've uh, uh, translated this into Spanish, and uh, they're planning on updating it on a regular basis. And uh, so um, this is another thing that you know, just a great tool to help us communicate uh, that uh, that story. So that's it. Any questions? You guys just aren't a rowdy crew this morning. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's um, uh, it's been it started out as a standalone um, spreadsheet, so to speak, on on a computer, and now we've transferred it to online. And uh, so you sit down and go through the, uh, the questions. I think there's uh, two, three hundred questions that uh, uh, address the internal and external risks for that farm. It asks how many breaks, what's the closest pigs, uh, how many pigs are, how many farms are in a three mile radius and a five mile radius, uh, how do you, how do you uh, uh, handle your trucks, you know, do you own the trucks, do you uh, uh, hire trucks, how close are sale barns and uh, packing plants. And then they go through the internal risks such as needle management. How often do you change needles when you're vaccinating sows or piglets? Um, do you use vaccine? Uh, have, uh, uh, you know, are your buildings mechanically ventilated or are they, uh, uh, you know, naturally ventilated? All those kind of things are addressed. And it was developed, uh, as uh, Dr. Kano said, by, uh, or, uh, or Dr. D, by uh, Dale Polson, and what he did is he gathered together uh, an expert panel, a lot of practitioners and researchers, and said, what are the important questions to ask? And so it actually started with probably a thousand questions, and then they've narrowed them down over time. And uh, it takes about uh, maybe an hour to uh, run through and do a risk assessment, 
And like I say, these students are, they are risk assessment machines. They go, they, uh, they know the questions to ask, they've got the uh, technology to then uh, submit that and uh, generate the reports. And so it's, it's, a, it's a great education tool and it's going to help us eventually uh, fill in some of those gaps and plug some holes too.